and welcome to the Be the Ultimate Assistant podcast with Bonnie and Vicki. I'm Vicki Sokol Evans. And I'm Bonnie Lowe Craman. Welcome, everyone. Hello. Hey, Bonnie. Hey, Vicki. So excited for today. I'm very excited today. It's such a curious topic, right? Celebrity assistance. Yeah. Uh, do you want to bring us up to speed on what, what we're doing today? To yeah. Well, you know, when we are planning these podcast episodes, we, we really put our minds to like, what are the burning topics that are going on all over the world? And as, as Vicki and I uh, do our workshops, the Be the Ultimate Assistant workshop all around the world, inevitably we hear questions about what is it really like to be a celebrity assistant? Um, as our listeners know, I worked with Olympia Dukakis, the Oscar winning actress for 25 years. And, and I, that was the curiosity about the work is what led me to writing the book, Be the Ultimate Assistant. And it led me to jumping on board to be a co-founder of New York Celebrity Assistants. And we're so lucky today that our, our guest happens to be the current president of New York Celebrity Assistants, which is so awesome. So our intent with these um, two parts with Kelly is to really pull the curtain back on what this work is really about. And if you decide you want to do it, how do you make that happen? So, uh, Vicki, why don't you introduce our guest? It would be my honor. So, Kelly Engstrom is assistant to celebrity interior designer and best-selling author Nate Berkus, a position she has held since 2010 when Nate was launching his talk show in New York. Previously, Kelly worked with the violinist Midori for nine years. Kelly is in her second term serving as president of NYCA, which stands for New York Celebrity Assistance. It's a professional organization which serves the unique needs of celebrity personal assistants in New York City and throughout the country. You have members throughout the country. And you guys have regular meetings and a private email system where they can collaborate and network and help solve problems as a collective group. She's originally from Cleveland, Ohio, and Kelly lives in Brooklyn with her husband, Seth, and their one-year-old daughter, Nora. She attended Fordham University in the Bronx, from which she earned a BA in communications and an affinity for Sicilian-style pizza. I don't blame you. <laughs> Welcome, Kelly. Hi. Thank you so much for having me, ladies. Ah, we're, we're so delighted to have you. So, Kelly... Why don't you tell us, you know, we know that no two stories of how celebrity assistants get their job is the same. What's your story? How did it happen for you? Well, like most assistants, um, I sort of fell into this business. I was enrolled at Fordham University, and I was looking for a part-time job while I was still in college. It was my senior year. And one of my friends worked for ICM, which is now Opus 3, a classical music management company and heard that Midori's assistant was looking for an assistant. So she called me and said, hey, it's flexible hours, um, you know, pretty standard office work, are you interested? So I, of course, I was interested and I took the job and I worked with Midori for a few years. I graduated, she and her publicist joined forces to give me a full-time job until Midori's assistant retired. At that point, I took over full-time as her assistant and projects director. I ran two residency programs with youth orchestras and university orchestras, a nonprofit organization for her, as well as handling all of those personal tasks. And so I worked with her from 2001 to 2010. And in 2010, I had started looking for new opportunities, just you know, feeling like I had spent my time in my first job and applied to um, almost every job that came through the NYCA pipeline. And one day I got a call, and it was the Nate Burkus show, looking for an assistant for Nate Burkus. I didn't know I was applying for Nate Burkus, so it was a real treat to hear about that. And so I, I went in for an interview. I met Nate the same day, and not long after that, I was wearing a headset and learning the ropes of TV production, which is wildly <laughs> different <laughs> than classical music outreach. So um, I love the transition. I love being part of a staff of 100 people after flying solo for a long, yeah. long time. Right. Th so now it's been like five years, right? Exactly five years. August yeah. 2nd. Oh. Five-year anniversary. So Congratulations. Long past it. Thank you. Um, Thank I know you. Vic has a question for you, but I, I think it's a really interesting point you made that when you went to interview for that job with Nate, you didn't know that it was Nate. 
And that's a pretty common phenomenon in the land of celebrity assistance, isn't it, Kelly, where assistants are asked to interview, but they're initially not even told who it's for. So like forget, do, forget doing homework or anything, right? Yeah, I mean, you know, I had a little time to prepare from the time they called until I walked in. But when I was sorting through all these job opportunities, very, very few of them actually name who the employer is. It's like, yeah, it's a big secret. It's actor or C-level celebrity or, right. you know, um, Fortune 500 executive, if that, if that. Um, yeah. And almost every job description has the same tasks in these initial posts. It's like calendar, travel, da, 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 da. So right. um, you just sort of cast your net and see what you can reel in and see what you learn from who calls you back. Right. So would you consider it, uh, ladies, for bo both of you, you guys can, either one of you can answer this one, is would it be a red flag if the, if the celebrity's name was posted in the job description? Because like, I have seen, you know, on Craigslist and on the web, like, uh, highly publicized job descriptions, um, you know, for um, hip-hop artists and things like that online. And that was a few years ago. I don't know if it's prevalent now, but is that a red flag when the celebrity's name is just, like, plastered all over it? Could it be a scam? Yeah, so. It depends, I guess, on your source. Like, if you're looking on Craigslist, it's probably not as vetted as job opportunities that come through, say, NYCA or, or recruiters. If they come through like an established professional network, you can pretty much trust that, that they're posting the truth. Right. But it, it, does highlight, it does highlight the need for confidentiality when, they're, when the names are not placed on there. And so then the game begins, you know, a big guessing game among assistants. Like, who do you think it is? <laughs> right. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and after after many years of being in the business, you start to you know you can start to infer like what right. kind of you know even what kind of business um, yes. this position would exactly. be in or you right. know how 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 hard it would be um, right. And sometimes you can tell by the part of town that it's in, et cetera. So it's funny. Yeah, yeah, you can pick up a lot, even yep. from the Vegas job postings. Well, and that shows how great the assistant is too. You know, we have to, do, <laughs> we do have to be a detective to a degree. Yes. Yeah, detective, translator, interpreter, all of those things. Yeah. <laughs> so, so let's talk about the typical or atypical job description, if there even, even even is one, um, you know, obviously in a corporate environment, there are standard, you know, executive assistant roles, um, even as a personal assistant, kind of the standard PA role, but um, it sounds like, I mean, even your two jobs with, the job with Midori and the job with Nate, very different um, roles. What, I mean, is that what people can expect, that they're going to be different every single way, or how are they alike? No, yeah, they're as different as the person you're working for. Um, as different as their business is from anybody else. So, you know, in that way, my responsibilities are pretty typical in the broad scope of doing everything and anything that Nate would need me to do. And I'm always going between professional and personal with him. Um, and, you know, different situations call for, you know, they might have a team of people, one executive assistant, one personal assistant. That's, you know, that's another different setup. But, um, you know, I take care of the traditional tasks of gatekeeping and managing calendars and booking appointments and travel. But with Nate, I also attend design client meetings with him. I've been thrown in to project manage Nate's own personal renovations as well as some for um, the Nate Purpose Associates clients. I assist the team with the social media. Last fall, Nate launched a storefront on firstdibs.com, which is um, an awesome, huge website for selling vintage and antique furniture and jewelry. And I'm also currently overseeing the total redesign of natepurpose.com. Wow. Which is time to launch. Yeah, it's really exciting. It's time to launch with the, the company's 20th anniversary next month. So we are racing to sign off on the design and get it going for an October 1st launch. Oh, that's so exciting. Now, did you have any idea you were capable of doing that? No, and, you know, that's something, <laughs> that's something that, like, has happened to me from day one is you get thrown into these situations. Right. The first time I felt sort of 
tested as Midori won the Avery Fisher Prize in 2002, and it was my second year of working for her. And with that prize comes $50,000. And she said, with that money, I'm going to launch this nonprofit organization, figure it out. So, you know, I learned how to reach out to, you know, arts lawyers, how to get a nonprofit organization incorporated, all of those things that have actually served me fairly well over the years. And, you know, the same thing happened when I was working with Nate, and he said, hey, I'm buying this apartment in the West Village, and I need right. to renovate it in three mm-hmm. months. Guess what you're doing this summer? Right. Um, and it's great, and I loved it, and I've done, <laughs> I've done three renovations uh, for Nate personally in the last five years, so I'm getting better and better at yeah. knowing what paint finishes and ball valves and subway tile and all of those things they fit into a design. You know, Louis Olympia's husband over the years would often say to me, you know, if he would say, my gosh, Bonnie, if you ever left us, you could, you're capable of doing so many things out in the world. You know, the, the challenge for me was buying not one, but two houses on the island of St. Martin. You know, mm-hmm. like, what did I know about buying international property? Right. But it, it speaks to and, the uh, can do attitude. What right? sort of time did you do that? I was just wondering. Was there an internet? Uh, oh, uh, actually, no. <laughs> <laughs> Just fax machine and pagers? I can't even imagine. It, it was crazy. Well, we lived through the Academy Award with no cell phone. It was, you know, it was possible. What I, um, it, just craziness, you know, to think about what was possible before the massive technology we've got right now. You guys, would you guys consider that, um, you know, in your role as a personal and celebrity assistant, you have to be entrepreneurial? I mean, because you're, you're creating a nonprofit and you're, you know, doing all these things from scratch. You're building these things. It sounds very entrepreneurial to me. Well, I think you have to have that mentality when you're working with an entrepreneur. I mean, Nate is a businessman, and so I have to think in terms of his company and branding. And yeah, you have to be, you're expected to sort of change your hats as needed. So with that task, I definitely thought as, you know, sort of as the person going out and trying to found this organization for her, it's like, what do we need? What's the checklist? How can we best set this up? Yeah, you're not so wrong you're, about that, Vic. You're, I think. If, you, if you're someone that can, that wants to work nine to five or needs structure, or needs guidance, uh, needs someone to develop the checklist, this is probably not a role for you. No. Okay. <laughs> Simply <laughs> said, it's not. Um, I think you're the one making your checklists. You're the one making the checklists for everybody, for your boss, for the team if need be. But absolutely, you need to sort of run your own show. Like a project manager. Definitely. Yeah, indeed. Indeed. Yeah. Of the highest order with yes. everyone coming to you. You bet. So, Kelly, what do you love about your work with Nate? What do you love about it? Oh, there's so much. It, like, it's kind of funny because we just sort of gush about each other half the time. But we have a great relationship. You know, step one, I get to work with an amazing interior designer and his brand, which, you know, extends into Target stores now and Joanne Fabrics. And he's written two best-selling books. He's been on, you know, multiple television shows from Oprah Winfrey to The Nate Berkeley Show to American Dream Builders. And so I love that broad scope of his brand and getting to learn all those different arms, like sort of alongside Nate. And his staff is amazing. It's it's a staff full of women, and there's about a dozen employees who work at his design firm in Chicago, and they've all been with him for years. And his publicist and I are both based in New York, and we all just work so seamlessly together. There's such enthusiasm among the teams. And that's a really fun environment physically and virtually and just emotionally to be a part of. It's it's always exciting. And then sort of in particular to me, Nick gives me challenges that go beyond the typical scope of work. You know, like I mentioned, um, the redesign of the website and managing this first dip storefront. I'm really proud of what I've been doing with those tasks and he listens to what I'm interested in and tailors my job towards me. You know, it's also serving his needs, but he he really is thoughtful about 
giving his employees, you know, work that's super satisfying. Totally cool. How smart of him. And it's really <laughs> smart. It shows him as a really great manager, frankly. You bet. He's easy to work for, you know. So since I'm the only one who hasn't been a celebrity assistant, I'm going to ask the uh, questions, the very curious questions. Are there, what are some of the unusual tasks that you've had to do with either for, for Nate or Midori? I guess the most extreme example was with Midori, and it was, it was I think it was in about 2006 or 2007, and we didn't have smartphones. It was definitely before smartphones and all of that. But she called me, and she was performing in Denver, Colorado, and the seam on her violin had opened. So, you know, the violin is, are pieces of wood glued together, essentially, and the glue had opened up, and so her violin would not sound right. And she played on a Del Jesu, a 1734 Del Jesu, and she needed to play the concert I'm sorry. that night. I'm sorry, Kelly. Did you say 1734? Is that the model or is that the year? Oh no, it's the year. It's oh my gosh. Oh my goodness. Yeah, it's um, <laughs> it's that old. It's almost 300 years old. Oh my gosh. Okay. Sorry, that was darn glue. classical music business. Yeah. So you know, it take the violins are very sensitive. From you know the Stradivarius and the Del Jesu, those are the two big makers. Um, and she had a Del Jesu and. She called me and she said, um, my violin seam has opened. I need, I need you to come pick it up and bring me my second violin. So I got on a plane to Denver in the morning with no luggage, no nothing. All I had was a violin in a case worth you know, a few million dollars. And took her the violin, exchanged the violin with her, stayed for the concert. And then I flew back to New York to get her primary violin repaired for her next concert. So that was that was a busy day. Oh my gosh, <laughs> were you off that day? It was, or, it was a Saturday. It was indeed Saturday. a Saturday. Yeah. Um, it couldn't happen on a Tuesday. It was a Saturday. Yeah. <laughs> These things wow. always happen on a Saturday or nighttime, and and let me just say that it, you know that's certainly unusual, but pretty much every celebrity assistant we know has those we call them save the day stories. The yeah. the, the pull off a miracle story. And, and it, it's kind of the standard operating procedure, isn't it? It is. It is. Um, you know, you start performing some magic tricks, and then they become expected. <laughs> <laughs> and, of course, I always have to ask, like, what are the perks? Um, any, any interesting, fun things that you've received in, as, as part of your role? Oh, gosh. Um, this question is very well timed. Last month, <laughs> do tell. Um, I will. Last month, I was featured in Room Magazine because Nate gave my living room and kitchen a uh, makeover. Mm. So we had it photographed and published, and I have a Nate Berkus designed living room and kitchen. Um, oh my wow. God. Yeah, yeah, which is super special. My husband and I decided to be grown ups and invest in a new sofa after living in our apartment for eight years and kind of having some mismatched couches and things like that. So we bought a new sectional and that set Nate off onto a whole thing of, well, if you're getting this new sofa, you need this and this and this. And oh my gosh. Like, let's, let's sell it. Let's get the publicist involved. And Rue Magazine got on board with it and they photographed my home in June and the story ran in July and I get to live in this lovely name for Oh my gosh, that's oh, amazing. That's so it was sort of like the ultimate perk. Is there a way for us to link to that uh, article? For sure. Okay, so we'll get the we'll get the link and yeah. make sure we have it. Yeah, okay, we'll perfect. include that in the you know on the website so that people can click on it and take a look at the article. Oh, nice. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Oh, that's so great. So Kelly, you served as president and so well. Thank you so much <laughs> of NYCA for the last two and a half years. You're magnificent. Can you talk about what the importance of New York Celebrity Assistance is in your work and, you know, how it impacts Celebrity Assistance? It's hugely important. You know, I worked for so long um, by myself and without knowing about NYCA until another classical musician's assistant said, have you ever heard of this group? You should join it. And I finally joined it in, in 2009. And it was honestly revelatory to meet people who did the same thing I was doing, right. um, who got thrown into these situations, and who, who got it, 
just flat out got it and understood. So NYCA, it's all about the support and the network. I'm a better assistant because of NYCA. There's no question yeah. about that. And I definitely tell Nate when when I get help from NYCA, and he loves it. He's always like, say hey to the gang for me. Olympia was always like that as well. Yeah. Very, you know, super supportive. And, you know, I've made great friends and great connections through NYCA over the years. And so you're thinking about 140 members of NYCA and their Rolodexes. And so when you ask a question out to this whole membership, everybody searches in their amazing Rolodexes for the answer, for the right contact. Um, it's a really, really powerful thing. We always have, we almost always have answers for each other, and it's honestly the best safety net when your employer has a wild request. Do you have an example of something that came through either for, for you or for someone else? Um, without, you know, without, you know, breaching confidentiality, but just something, some examples or one? When Nate was taping his talk show, his driver's license expired. And he had, a, he had a, an Illinois license, and so he needed a New York license. And you cannot renew online if you're getting a new state ID. So um, we really couldn't think about Nate going to the DMV and waiting in line and spending all that time. And I put it out to NYCA, and lo and behold, someone had a contact, and I was able to get Nate a private appointment at the DMV, and he was done in half an hour. Yeah, oh, that felt that felt sort of magical because the DMV is a tough nut to crack. You bet. Um, it's tough to get around going through an organization like that. But we did have that, and that was that was kind of a heroic moment. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, think about how much time it saved him and all of you. Like, it's it's that's brilliant. I love that. And I mean, he was in the he was on in full on daytime TV production, so he almost was never available between 7 a.m. and 7 p.m. Yeah. every day of the week. So how could he go to the regular DMV office and sit around and wait? Um, I mean, I think the point is that these people are living unusual lives and therefore unusual solutions are needed to these particular problems. Not to mention the fact that if he had shown up at DMV, he would have caused, you know, a very big scene. They would not have been prepared for the for security etc it was the same way when you know celebrities get called for jury duty mm -hmm. so it's uh that, that's why this network of people for new york celebrity assistance is so brilliant so any of our listeners if you're serious about this work and you're actually doing it it makes so much sense to join absolutely um it's it can only help you it only makes you better oh you bet so, Kelly, can we talk a little bit about um, this thing called work-life balance, if there is such a thing? You know, you, you talked about uh, Midori's violin situation on a Saturday, and that is kind of typical to be working potentially uh, on your off hours. But tell me what you do. Do you do anything specific to have that work-life balance? What is your schedule like with Nate right now? Well, Nate always makes sort of a joke about how I am – the queen of boundaries and you know he knew my expectations from the start and I knew his expectations from the start and and they jived and they've evolved over the years of course um, just based on what he's doing and based on our own personal lives so this is actually a question that was asked um, of another speaker at a conference that Vicki, Bonnie, um, the three of us participated in earlier this year and I haven't been able to get it out of my mind because the person it was asked of said, no, it is not possible to have a work-life balance. And I, I couldn't disagree more. I think you can absolutely find a work-life balance, even in the crazy life of being a celebrity assistant, if you just find what that balance is and what it means to you. It doesn't necessarily mean you're only working between 9 a.m. and p.m. or you feel like you have equal time working and leisure. It's it's about understanding the expectations of your job, how you know what you're willing to do, how much you're willing to work, and establishing those boundaries. Nate always mentions that I have strong feelings about boundaries, and and I think that's why our relationship works from the get-go. I asked what sort of he expected of me if I was expected to work on the weekends, and I knew that wasn't something I was willing to do on a regular basis. Obviously, emergencies happen, such as my violin story, and you know that if you're in this profession, for sure, you know that these things happen, and 
that sometimes your personal life will get upended a little bit because work needs you. But you know, you get into a rhythm with your boss and you get into a rhythm with your work. And as a working mom, I came back to work after maternity leave and I had a I had my full maternity, well, my almost full maternity leave because Nate got married. I came back a week early for Nate's wedding. So I, as I came back, we had to figure out a new, a new routine and new boundaries around my having an infant daughter. And so we knew when I needed to leave work to pick her up from daycare in Brooklyn. She goes to bed at a certain time every night. And so I said to Nate, you know, if there's an emergency between... 6 and 7.30, call me, don't email me, because I'm probably not looking at my phone. Mm -hmm. But I, I can hear the phone ring, obviously. I mean, and I, so we, we've gotten into that, and it's we've settled into it nicely, and he's a new dad, so I think he appreciates my sort of being the first one up to bat as far as parenthood and working and seeing how we figured it out for me, and now that both of us are in this boat, we figured it out again. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree with you more, Kelly. And I think you make some really great points, including the importance of saying what you need and setting those boundaries. It just means speaking up. And too many assistants, what we have found all over the world, are reluctant to say what they need. And then further than that, your situation has changed. You know, you have a new normal now with the babies in play. And so that speaks to the idea that no job description of any celebrity assistant is ever in stone. Absolutely. It's shifting and moving and not only for you, but for your celebrity employer. So it's really important to be responsive to those changes as they happen. I mean, in 25 years, my, you know, the ebb and flow of all of this change dramatically as your kids grow older. So I, I think those are really important things to highlight for anyone listening who's even thinking about being a celebrity assistant. It, it doesn't stay the same. Nothing ever does, just like life. No, it's very true. Someone's personal life and their work life, and they're so entwined with yours, you just need to be honest and frank with yourself and with your employer about what, what you can do and what you can't do. Um, and saying yes to everything doesn't make you a better assistant, to you be better. honest. Right. And killing yourself and working 60, 70 hour weeks doesn't either because, you know, newsflash, we're still all human here, right? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, if, if that's what you want to do and you honestly, truly want to work 12 hours a day, then, you know, I'm sure you can find a job doing that. But um, a lot of people can find a balance. It's about being willing to stand up for yourself and, and talk about it. That's the key thing. That's such, oh, thank you so much. That was terrific. So, so Kelly, I have one, for me, one final question to ask you for this episode. And of course, the next episode, we're going to talk about the how, like how do you, how do you become a celebrity assistant? But um, what, what do you see as the top misconceptions about working as a celebrity assistant? Because, you know, for those of us who aren't celebrity assistants, we have this like grand idea of like what it's like. Oh, they must have like so much fun. I get dressed up and all their shoes. <laughs> <laughs> all kinds of stuff. Like, what, is, what are the misconceptions that you see that that, that we have? <laughs> I mean, you know, I think it's on the extremes. It's like the glamour of the job, um, mm -hmm. which definitely, you know, it happens. It's like you you're working a red carpet and you're seeing all of these wonderful people come down and getting your picture taken and attending you know, sort of exclusive events with your employer, being backstage at a TV show, like all that great behind the scenes stuff. It's definitely part of the job and it's fun. It makes it exciting and fun and glamorous. But, you know, there are definitely, there's definitely the other angle where people think, I think for celebrity assistants, personal assistants, that were sort of this downtrodden, you know, beaten up group of people who just have to do everything and have to do all of these things and we don't have personal lives and and that's, you know, that's not true either, but I've definitely done my share of waiting for the cable company or walking the dog or picking up dry cleaning and, you know, that's, it's all part of the job. It's one day, you know, I'm in a, I'm in a fantastic dinner event with Nate and another day I am, you know, picking up tile from a, a yard in Brooklyn, you know, it's the it's gamut, just, the gamut yeah. is immense. 
And so I think people see both extremes, you know. And there are also days where I'm at my desk, plugging along, having a great day, doing spreadsheets and having conference calls about the new PR plan for the Target product coming out in the holiday season. And, you know, so that's sort of the in-between stuff. And it's all great. But there's <laughs> there's a variety of of tasks and events and perks and problems, um, just like any. Yeah, that's great, Kelly. That's great. Well, thank you so much for sharing these ideas with us. Uh, so illuminating. As we close out part one of our time with you, Kelly, would you do you have a favorite quote or an idea that that you'd like to leave us with? I do, um, and you know what? It's from my dad. And I grew up playing softball, and my dad was our coach. And he would always say to us, don't be sorry, just don't do it again. If you dropped a fly ball or, you, you know, you ended up striking out at the plate, and you'd be like, oh, sorry, sorry, I did that. And his point was, like, you shouldn't just apologize for something, but you should learn from it. And you should learn mm. how not to strike out and how to catch that fly ball and how to do better apologies don't really improve the situation when it's something like that. And you can learn from your mistakes and you'll be better off in the long run because apologies sometimes are just hopeful covers to get everybody to forget about it mm. when you could really take that and make it into a great learning experience. I love it. Great. That's awesome. Well, we're looking forward to the next episode when we talk to you about how do you become a celebrity assistant? Because that's probably at this point, now that you've painted the great picture about the what the life is, uh, what your life is like. I'm sure there are a lot of listeners who are interested in in knowing how to go about becoming a celebrity assistant. So that's going to be right. awesome. And let me just finish out this first part one. I just want to share with our listeners that if you're curious about, you know, more about what this work is all about. Many members of NYCA were quoted in in my book, Be the Ultimate Assistant. So I would love for you to check it out and, and to learn more about what this work is actually, the nuts and bolts of what this is all about. Well, that concludes today's episode. We'd love your feedback, topic ideas, and questions. Visit the podcast page at BeTheUltimateAssistant.com. Thank you once again to our guest, Kelly Engstrom, and to you for listening. We'll see you next time. Bye, Bonnie. Bye, Vicki. Bye, Kelly. Bye. Bye, lady. Bye, everyone. <laughs>